we're to our last experiment, which is hydraulic jump. And I want to start with making a definition. Um, we talk about um, we talked about the Reynolds number, but for this experiment, we're going to start with a different dimensionless quantity. And that is the Froude number. Uh, my uh, great grand uncle James, in his presentation on propulsive power of ships, refers to the investigations of the elder Froude, um, who did these investigations in England, and after whom the Froude number is named. Is named. In any event, the fruit number, and there's a couple of ways of designating this, you'll see, is equal to the velocity over the square root c times some distance. And if we have, uh, if we're going to, for, the, for this particular experiment, we're going to restrict ourselves to vertically walled channels. In other words, channels where it comes down here, this and this. And by the way, probably, and there's water in it. It probably bears mentioning that there's something I need to explain. And that is this. That the from that um, up to now, you know, we had closed piping in the uh, uh, flow metering experiment. We had pipes where the pipe was closed and it was still completely fluid. And we, in the wind tunnel, we kind of flip that. We have an object in the middle of a free-flowing, infinite free-flowing, at least that's what we like to think, um, fluid. In this case, what we have is an open channel where the, where generally speaking, the, um, many of the restrictions don't apply. Open channel flow isn't important for any uh, storm sewers or oval open channel flow, dams that use open channel flow, Open channel flow is something which mainly occurs in civil engineering. So this civils, this one's for you. Okay, if we have an open channel, it's open to the top. Usually we don't pressurize open channels. Um, the fruit number, if we decide to assume that Q is equal to U times A, which is kind of the same assumption we've made before, you know, the uniform velocity with all the restrictions that I mentioned at the time, then this is equal to the flow, and the units can be tricky, W, W being that, the width of it. And we're talking about, I mean, you, you can have tapered channels, you can have all kinds, you can have bowl-shaped channels and whatnot, but we're going to, kind of like when we did the buoyancy instability, we used a flat bottom boat. In this case, we're going to do a little bit, we're going to kind of do the same thing. We're going to stick with that. G sub C to the square, actually it's the square root of G sub C times Y. And usually Y is that. I float. So therefore, for every um, fruit number, for every definite Q and Y and G sub C and W, we can know the fruit number. And we can also use the fruit number to back compute. I am going, the, the math of, behind this is a little tricky and some of the results are a little funky to watch, but basically what we're going to do is the following. If we have, the hydraulic jump is an energy transfer, transformation, and we're going, I'm just going to probably paint a broad brush of this. The theory is more detailed. If I have a dam or some kind of flow here, and if, if this comes out the bottom, by Torricelli's law, it's going to come out, if, you know, depending upon the, the height here, and, and then we actually are going to use, we're actually going to compute, estimate that velocity from that height. It's basically, um, it's kind of the PO tube in reverse, where instead of the velocity creating the height, the height turns into the velocity. And creates probably not exactly the term I should use, but that's what I used anyway. Um, but there is a critical depth at which we call y sub c. 
is equal to one third. And that critical depth is a critical flow. That critical flow is the um, point where the it, it is where the dividing is the dividing line between two types of flow. Below at the depths below the critical depth, it's supercritical flow. At depths above that, it's subcritical flow. If we come out with a high velocity flow out from under a dam. Whatever is in its path is not going to like the results, uh, whether it be a boat or whatever, and, or the sides of the uh, or the uh, sides of the, of the um, water, whatever, or, or the, or whatever is not going to like it, or the bottom. So what we do in hydraulic jump. is we go from state one, which is the way it comes out, to state two, and in the middle is the critical flow. And we're going to actually see this when we get to the flow. At critical flow, this fruit number is equal to one. Upstream is, and downstream, that's the one. Now, without going into a lot of the math of the subject, and again assuming the the, the two Frew numbers relate to each other in this way, and we can actually and I'm really skipping over a lot of really tricky algebra. And there are several ways of expressing this. In other words, the for a given hydraulic jump condition, the two fruit numbers can be related to each other. At the same time, this is y1. all over if I know if I can measure y1 and I can measure y2 I can get I can obtain you know, I can also solve for the first food number just by knowing the the relationship between these two. If I can solve for the fruit number, I can solve for, and I know what y is. I can also solve for the velocity. If I can also, or, or I can do this. I can put that in. If I know this fruit number, I can solve for this y and compute that q. So therefore, the whole point of this is if I know the relationship between us. Too, I can, in principle, at least, estimate the flow. Now, it's a little trickier in practice, but well, I can estimate that flow. <coughs> and I also have in my handout some different fruit number ranges and what you can expect based on actual data, not just, not, not just the theoretical data. We can also, at the same time, we can, we can, and I also have sample calculations in there too. We can also compute the energy loss. The delta E is also computable using the two
And that gives you a change of head, which can be multiplied by the flow and the unit weight to get an actual energy change, or actually it's power since we're dealing with a continuously flowing system. So that, in a nutshell, is what this is all about. And there will, there will be basically three things we will do with the data. The first thing to do is we'll take these two, estimate the flow numbers and the flow. We have in our a reference flow, a little flow meter in there that will give us a reference flow. If we can measure these two, we can actually determine that fruit number, and from that fruit number, we can determine the um, that fruit number. You can determine what flow you actually think you have using that, and you can do it for either side of the jump. One or two, you should get the same result. In fact. I've seen students actually plot the results they get from one side or the other, and of course you've got, you know, y is equal to that. Well, that's not exactly what I had in mind. But you can compare the flows that you get out of the hydraulic jump with the flows that you actually, that the flow meter is telling you. That's the first thing. The second thing you can, you can get, of course, is the energy loss using this equation we actually have some energy loss. We are actually trying to um, to still this. In fact, these, in fact, the places where this is done are called stilling basins. We're trying to slow the velocity down so that whatever is downstream will be happier with the uh, results we, that, that the dam is putting out. We want a big high head for, say, high, for hydroelectric um, production like we have with, with some kind of with TVA. But we also want to have the people downstream actually not have to navigate through a torrent all the time. So we do this, stilling basins. So there's some energy trend, uh, loss. And last but not least, we're going to estimate what we think the velocity should be based on this height. Now, the way this works, you've got water coming into here. And at a steady state position, this height is basically acting like, you know, we get a steady state position. This height is what's driving this flow. We're going to see if we can, using Torricelli's uh, theorem, whether this height will actually predict that flow or how accurately we can predict that flow. And then we can compare that also to the um, to, to the uh, theoretical flow that we get out of our little flow meter. So that, in a nutshell, is pretty much what we get with hydraulic jump. Our final experiment is hydraulic jump, and it will be performed using this flume. And basically this flume uh, works in this way. We have this very large and kind of nasty reservoir right at the moment. And the water is drawn in through, through here, and we make sure that the reservoir is full enough to prevent cavitation of the pump, which will burn up a pump in a hurry. And then we have a pump. We have a control valve for it. We have, and this is very important, we have a flow meter that it uses, uh, which is important. It used to be that we did this during bucket brigade, uh, bucket Brigade is not good at the 30 gallon a minute flows we use for this. Then we, it comes up. It comes up into this reservoir, or partly reservoir, and then it comes over here. And it creates a reservoir about right up here in this area. And then it goes through down here. It eventually shoots out. That, by the way, is a half an inch uh, deep, and that's what your Y1 for your jump calculations. Somewhere along this route here, it jumps, and we're going to measure it using this device here, which basically, like, kind of like with the hot rotating drum, you put the stick at the top of the flow, and you take the measurement up here, and it has a vernier and all that. And then the water returns, it goes back into the tank, and the cycle repeats again. Okay, let's fire this thing up and see what happens. Now, 
notice that the first thing you look on the left is that's filling up. And you also already have a hydraulic jump developed. Notice also that if we reach the point, we're going to reach the point where this is in equilibrium. This basically forms a reservoir that's pretty good. Like a dam, and if this is not empty like a dam, it has water behind it. And that water comes out at a certain velocity. One of the things you're going to be asked to, to, to show is that this step here to the bottom is, you know, can predict the flow that goes through here. This is Torricelli's law. Obviously, the higher this is, the more Torricelli's law, the more water goes through. And then the second thing is that you're going to be asked to do is to predict the chunk. And you see right now you've got a hydraulic chunk here. And that chunk can be varied with the flow. In the fact, the chunk can be used to predict the flow. One of the things you're going to be asked to do is to use that jump to predict the actual flow and measure against the little flow meter we have down there in the bottom as a reference. So what we're going to do is we're going to vary the flow uh, in several uh, increments and we're going to see what kind of different jump we get. As the hydraulic jump mechanism settles down and drains back, I want to thank everyone who has watched these videos and kind of joined in this adventure, both my students and those from elsewhere. So, as I always say at the end of the videos, thanks for watching and God bless.